again, thanks for coming to Lauder Park. This is the first of our lecture series for the next academic year, say. Um, the first talk today is Trisha, and we're going to follow up with air quality and, and water quality. This is our first endeavor into this joint uh, uh, cooperation, if you will. And it all kind of stems from our program with the McCann Foundation. The McCann Foundation has been a big benefactor to the zoo, actually for years and years. Now, formerly, we have the veterinary fellowship, the clinical fellowship. We had our first fellow, this was Ashley, she did all the manatee uh, coagulation research. Melissa is our current fellow. Melissa, please, thank you. Um, and the first fellowship was actually through the University of Florida, through the College of Veterinary Medicine. We decided amongst the zoo and actually the foundation that we really wanted to make this a, a little bit more local. And we wanted to change the focus of the, the clinical, well, the clinical training and the academic training for this fellow. And we thought that combining the clinical training experience that this person would get at the zoo would pair up very nicely with the opportunities that USF College of Public Health offers. And so to that end, the fellowship now consists of a couple of graduate certificates with a strong possibility that a master's could follow up to that. But that's, uh, Melissa, and you guys can sort that out later. <laughs> so to introduce our first uh, speaker of this series, uh, Dr. Kathleen Earl. Uh, many of you who are here from public health know this is like probably my part, favorite part of my entire job. <laughs> and I always tell Ray that we always meet in his office for some reason as opposed to coming over to mine because I just don't quite have that view. We're really excited about really thinking about animal health as a population sort of health. And that isn't always done well. Just as when we started with medicine and nursing, it was more of a focus on individual. And what public health does is population health. And so putting the two together was really a neat fit. And we, we were really excited about it. So one of the things that we wanted to do was sort of strengthen this collaborative feeling by doing things between the two areas. Even though I always want to come here, occasionally we're going to let me come over. Um, and he did a dean lecture, what, was about three years ago now, wasn't he? I think it was quite a few years ago. I didn't think it was that long, but maybe, maybe it is. It was so well <laughs> received. I had so many people who came up to me after that lecture so excited about the issues that Ray was describing he had with animals that people were studying among, you know, people. <laughs> and we thought, wow, you know, there's much more overlap than we really thought or appreciated. So that's how we moved on to this. And then um, we were very fortunate to get the, the funding from the McCann Foundation to allow us to support a fellow and also a program study. And what we want to do as part of that were a series of three lectures. And Lori, I am so grateful for Lori Wright, who was with us. And she moved on to another position and still was going to come down from Jacksonville today to do this lecture for us. And I've been to a number of her guest lectures because we were just laughing when she first came to the college. We all wanted her every day, all the time. So um, she's just amazing. Um, she, had, she came to us from a different background because she had her bachelor's in dietetics from Ohio State University. And then she combined that dietetic internship from Case Western University in Cleveland VA Hospital. So that's an interesting combination. And she has a PhD from USF. So that's sort of where she came from the background. She's been a clinical dietitian in VA for 16 years. And you were originally in the St. Pete campus and then came up to us. Tampa. Then, yeah. So, so we got her up from there, which was really exciting. But this semester, to our dismay, at least my personal dismay, but um, she got a position at the University of North Florida. And this is a wonderful position. She's directing the second doctorate in clinical nutrition in the nation. This is really important. And so really, we couldn't fault you for taking that opportunity. Um, her research areas there have been in food insecurity and global nutrition. She's an academy media spokesperson, an asset site visitor, and former BOD director. I'm not quite sure what all that is. Past president of the Florida Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, and the current public policy team person. So we've trained her a little <laughs> in public health and what that means, and she's trained us an awful lot in nutrition. And so thank you so much for coming, and she'll provide this lecture, which I'm looking forward to. Thank you. Can everyone hear me okay? Uh, so, um, as I said, uh, when we, when Kathleen asked me to talk about um, nutrition, I thought at first I'm like, oh, nutrition, sure, I'm, no problem. I love to talk about nutrition. Um, but then, as I was preparing the the talk, I really, really like to tailor it 
to the audience specifically. And there is a wide variety in our audience today. So, um, but I, I have worked, um, been involved with uh, Dr. Eduardo Valdez at um, Disney's Animal Kingdom. And um, the, the juncture between human nutrition and animal nutrition is becoming more and more apparent all the time. Um, many of the diseases that you as keepers are seeing in your animals today are what we, this whole wave of obesity and chronic diseases that we've been experiencing and treating in humans. So um, that's why on some cases, Eduardo and I have, have consulted, um, and he's done a lot of training with some of my students. So I will try to keep this as relevant as, as possible to, to you all. Um, but I am going to take you back to some basic principles and begin, of course, with what is nutrition. This is a very long uh, definition, but nutrition is the science of food, the nutrients and other substances within food, and their action, interaction, um, all in relationship to health and disease. So there, although it's very long, there's some things that are very important about this, and it, one is it's about food, because we think sometimes very clinically about, oh, it's, they need this amount of protein and this amount of fat, but it is all packaged in food. And food has the nutrients, the chemicals that nourish the body, but they all and they have other things too. And sometimes those other things can be very helpful um, when we talk about fruits and vegetables. Fruits and vegetables have a lot of vitamins and minerals, but they also have these other substances. They're not nutrients but things like phytochemicals that are very helpful. They ha actually help us protect us against cancer. So if we're just thinking nutrients, sometimes we lose out on those other substances, the benefits of other substances. Like other, likewise, or flip side, there are other things in food um, that aren't so helpful. But when we, we, we eat in terms of food, and we're thinking um, not only of the nutrients, but the other substances too. And so this is all about how we take it in, utilize the nutrients, and how we balance this out to prevent disease and treat disease. So why is nutrition important? Why did they feel that this was an important topic to cover? Well, it really has a large effect not only on physical health um, and, and very often, you know, cognitive health too. Um, when an animal, when a baby is born, they're still a work in progress, whether it be human, animal, we're still a work in progress. Things are still developing, especially in the brain. And without proper nutrition, that can be stunted or um, otherwise lost. Um, nutrition is important to breeding, the ability to have, to reproduce, very much their behavior. I mean, I love that commercial about being hangry. I, I bet you animals get angry too. Um, they, I'm sure the, the keepers can give some examples of that. The development of disease and the treatment of disease and their overall lifespan and mortality. And in the zoo game, I think that lifespan and mor morbidity are very important because the costs of, of these animals m must be incredible. So there are a lot of challenges. It isn't a, like feeding um, our dogs and cats that we have a lot of research on. There's a lot of challenges that come with, with feeding wild animals, and the translations are not as simple. We don't have as much information about the diets of wild animals. We have a lot of limitations, or we don't have many studies on what are the actual nutrient needs. We can, you know, kind of extrapolate, but they aren't pure studies on those specific animals. Um, wild versus captive animals, there's a lot of differences in their physical activity patterns. And the, they have, just when you think you've got it down, then there's some changes in their nutrient requirements depending on their growth or, or health status and such. These are just the guidelines, the overall guidelines from ACA aim to provide a nutritional balanced diet, provide a diet that is reasonably stimulates natural feeding behaviors, um, provides a nutritionally balanced diet, um, and provide a diet that meets all the above criteria in a 
um, practical and economic um, um, way to feed. And, and I know that's, that's a big issue, too. Um, I, one thing I do like that I, you know, some parallels that I draw when between animals and, 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 and children, when we talk about a toddler, an infant, and we're talking about introducing solid foods, we talk a lot about the nutrients, but we also talk about other issues. It's not just the feeding process isn't just about the nutrients and making sure we're getting enough nutrients. That when, a, when an infant starts grasping, say those Cheerios that you throw out for them, they're grasping and pulling them to their mouth, that's actually developing um, their brains. It's a, it's a method of stimulating cognitive development. And with animals, I think it's so important to think about the experience, too, that, you know, as much of the, the natural feeding, the instincts that we can provide to them in captivity, um, and really looking at it more holistically than just what are the nutrients that we're going to get into them. So there's five general factors that I'm going to talk about when you're looking at developing a, a diet for the animals. Number one, and what we're gonna put the most emphasis on, because that's my comfort zone, is, is the nutritional requirements. We're also gonna talk about feeding type and the digestive tract, their, their access to food, their health status, and the, the actual management of the animals. So this is Nutrition 101. Um, as I said, um, we don't have as much information about specific nutrient needs for specific species. So sometimes we have to select a similar species and try to apply it to that, that species. We need to consider the macronutrients, which we're going to talk about, the micronutrients um, and their energy requirements. And other things that go into this is beyond the, the nutrient needs, they're going to change based on um, the seasonality, when it's hotter, they're, they're going to burn a little bit more calories or more energy. There's their place in the life cycle and, of course, their, their um, physical activity. So I had said this, that within that food stuff, the chemicals that actually nourish the body are called nutrients. And we have six classes of nutrients. Um, I always give the example with with food and, and nutrients, or I ask, are, are food and nutrients the same thing? And sometimes people go, yes, and then people, like, they take their cues, like, well, she wouldn't be asking that if it was the same thing, right? So, um, so you can think of some foods that you eat that really don't have any nutrients in them, or very few nutrients in them. Like, a soda, um, maybe Captain Crunch, or something like that. So, um, you know, there are food stuff that don't contain a lot of nutrients. And then there's some food that's really dense with the foods. Um, so the, it's those chemicals that actually nourish the body that we're focusing on. And it's carbohydrates, proteins, fats, vitamins, minerals, and water. And I'm going to take the, you through them briefly. Carbohydrates are... There are, when we look at the other nutrients, we can have long lists of functions for the various nutrients. But with carbohydrates, the one function that carbohydrates are designed for is energy. That is the fuel that the body is made for. There, we have other because the body, you know, the body is an amazing thing. It has different fuel systems, but the fuel system that it's designed to use predominantly is, is carbohydrates. So if you think about your car, and say you have one of those expensive cars that you have to, you're supposed to use the high octane uh, gas, and um, if you don't have, let's say, you don't have a lot of money to spend, so you use the low octane, your car's still going to run, right? But what's going to happen is you get a lot of nicks and pings, and it isn't over the long run not going to run as well. Well, that's the way bodies are, too. They're designed to use carbohydrates. They can, in a pinch, use fats. They can use proteins. But they come with pings or problems if you use them for long. 
your body is designed to use, or animals' bodies are designed to use carbohydrates. When we talk about carbohydrates, we classify them by complexity. There's three levels of complexity, and there's three types under each level. So we have the monosaccharides, mono, one, sugar. So these are three single sugars. And those single sugars are glucose, fructose, and galactose. So you've all heard of glucose. You go and get your blood test drawn, or you're looking at the labs on the animals. And glucose is the primary energy that the cells use. Fructose and galactose are converted to glucose for the cells to use for energy. There, the second level of carbohydrates are the disaccharides. Those are two sugars linked together. And there are three of them. There's sucrose, lactose, and maltose. Sucrose is table sugar. And that's a glucose and a fructose linked together. Um, the body breaks that down when you consume it, um, and we utilize the glucose for energy. Lactose is the lactose and glucose linked together. That's milk sugar. And then maltose is just two glucose molecules linked together. Um, there's not a lot of pure forms of maltose except beer. You're a beer brewer. You know, that's a big one. And the third level of complexity it's the polysaccharides, poly, many, and these are literally hundreds of glucose molecules linked together. And there are three types of polysaccharides. There are, there is starch. Starch is found, is hundreds of glucose molecules linked together. It's found in plants. So, um, you know, your, your vegetables, your grains, those are, that's more of a starch. Glycogen is hundreds of glucose molecules linked together, but it's found in animals. And it actually is one of our, it's our short-term energy storage system. So it's found in our liver and our muscles, and it's, it's quick energy that we need, kind of like in a fight or flight situation. And the third polysaccharide is fiber. It's hundreds of glucose molecules linked together, found in plants. So what's the difference? We don't digest it. And that carries its own health benefits. Um, so... Often, we hear the term, though, simple versus complex. Many of you have never heard of that polysaccharide stuff before and never want to hear it again, but you've heard of simple and complex. So simple are usually the mono um, and disaccharides, which usually things like the sodas, candies. These are the quick sugars. Um, and going back to its original function, energy, these simple carbohydrates deliver their energy very quickly. It's 20 to 30 minutes. Um, the analogy I always give is when a kid gets into Halloween candy. They're like running around full of energy, and then you come back half an hour later, what are they doing? They're crashed. Um, so that's quick energy. Usually the simple carbohydrates are not packaged with many other nutrients. It's just the sugar, and that's it. <coughs> The complex carbohydrates are more the polysaccharides. Their energy is released over three to four hours. It's a nice plateau of energy. Go up slowly, plateau, and go down slowly. Um, found in things like whole grains, starchy vegetables, they also contain, besides energy, they also contain other vitamins and minerals and fiber. Where we have kind of like the gray zone, the middle ground, which is like milk sugar. It's a disaccharide. Its energy doesn't last as long as the complex carbohydrates, but it is packaged with other nutrients like calcium and, and protein. So they're kind of in the middle of the road. We, we like them better than, than the samples. Okay, second class of nutrients is proteins. And proteins the building block of proteins are the amino acids. There are some 20 amino acids. Um, every amino acid has an acid group, a base group, and then they have a side chain that makes it unique. And we classify the amino acids based on whether or not they're essential or non-essential. And essential means that the body can't make it, that we have to get it from some outside food source. 
And um, essentiality varies by species. Even, life, even by lifespan, infant, human infants may have more essential um, amino acids than an adult. Um, in times of illness, some amino acids become essential, like glutamine in humans. But just an example, cats, taurine is essential. In dogs, it isn't. They can make it. What does protein do? In a whole long list. And you can actually look at the, the chemical structure of an amino acid and see how, why a protein could do this. Um, it's involved in um, water and electrolyte balance, so it helps move water in and out of the cells. It's involved in acid-base balance. Well, when you have an acid in a base inside the amino acid, if the balance gets off, amino acid can contribute a base if we're, if we're too acidic and vice versa. What everybody thinks of with protein, though, is building and repairing tissue. Um, we can use it for energy. We don't want to use it for energy because look at all these other important functions. We don't want to use protein. We want to spare protein, but we can. Um, secretions, it transports um, different uh, molecules, it transports um, medicines that we give, um, and it's very important in the immune system. Um, I'll give you an example, another human example uh, of a protein deficiency. So you, you know those commercials you see with a, a child, um, you know, they're a starving child in Africa, and you see a child that has a very distorted belly. Um, is that a fat belly? What is that belly? Go back to one. Yeah, it's malnutrition, but what, what's in there? It's fluid. So we don't have enough protein to keep the, the fluids in the proper compartment, so that's a belly full of water. You'll also see the child um, probably has very thin hair or no hair at all because they can't grow the hair. The body's going to put other priorities first than growing hair. You'll see discoloration in their hair, all because of a protein deficiency. Their immune system, they're very vulnerable to infectious diseases, um, diarrhea. So that all goes back to the functions of, of protein. Very, very important. Um, when we talk about proteins, we talk about quality proteins. And I feel like from the human standpoint, I, I get so many questions about protein because it's all the rage now. Every cereal, English muffin is high protein. Um, and protein is critical, but um, quality of these proteins is very, very important. When we talk about quality, there's many different ways that we can grade quality, but probably the simplest way to think about it is complete or incomplete proteins. Complete proteins contain all the essential amino acids in the adequate amounts. Um, an incomplete protein is missing one or more essential amino acid, and that's called the limiting amino acid. Um, in general, when we think about complete proteins, we usually look at animal proteins as complete and plant proteins as incomplete. A couple exceptions to that rule, soy and quinoa are, com are complete proteins. Um, now, that doesn't mean that we can't offset that. If you look at cultures that have developed and thrived over uh, thousands of years, many times the staple of their diet is an example of complementing, putting two incomplete proteins together like rice and beans. That's a very good example. Okay, um, the third <laughs> class of nutrients are lipids. Lipids is a family, really. That um, There are three types of lipids, fat, sterols, and phospholipids. Fat is what is the essential nutrient. There are essential fats. Um, sterols the body makes. Um, the best example of a sterile is a cholesterol, and cholesterol certainly our body makes, and sometimes for some people we make way too much. Um, and then the third member of the lipid family 
is a phospholipid that's lecithin. Lecithin, even though it's considered a lipid, it actually looks a lot like vitamin D if you look at it. Um, and it is not essential either. The body makes it. Although, if you were around in the 70s, lecithin was lecithin supplements were all the rage for sex drive. Um, just put, you know, they can say anything they want, so they do. <laughs> so what we're focusing on are the fats. Um, fats are made up of, they have a backbone, a glycerol backbone, and they, they have fatty acids attached to the glycerol backbone. Um, they usually come in threes. That's why we have what's called a triglyceride. And that's how it, how it circulates in the blood. If you ever had your blood test done, you, they'll tell you what your triglycerides are. Those are the circulating fats in your bloodstream. Um, it's the fatty acids that we, um, there are several fatty acids that are essential. So what, you know, when I say fat, people usually go, ooh, fat. Fat, it serves several functions. Within dietary fat provides those essential fatty acids that we cannot make, that we need for health. That it's a source of energy, though we don't want to use it for energy. Um, animals have, their hibernating animals have adapted to this. Um, fat has over twice as many calories as carbohydrates and proteins. And we, it is a, in our body, it's a storage system. So body fat is also called adipose. That's a nice storage system. Hibernating animals will pack up or increase that stored energy, the adipose, to get them through those long periods of, of hibernation. Um, we don't hibernate, so we don't need that fat. Um, and many of our other animals don't need that fat because excess body fat um, is what is associated with many of the metabolic diseases like diabetes and um, cardiovascular disease. Um, and then the other function of dietary fat is to carry fat-soluble vitamins. So there's certain vitamins that, um, that they have to tag on to fat and, and be distributed to the body. So now we're moving on to the small nutrients, which are the vitamins and minerals and water, and they do not provide any energy. They don't provide, they don't have any calories. When I do vitamins and minerals, it is like the most boring class or boring part of class. Um, so I, I group them together by similar functions, similar foods to help you kind of remember them. So the first one doesn't really have a good uh, partner in crime. So it's just the vision vitamin, vitamin A. It's important um, in not only vision, specifically night vision. But it's a, uh, an important part of the lining of the GI tract, starting in the mouth. Um, and it's involved in bone growth. Vitamin A comes in two forms. It comes in an animal form and a plant form. The animal form is retinol. And so that's what you'd find like in, in liver, for all of you that eat liver. Um, carotene is the plant form. And it's actually what gives plants a lot of their colors. So the deep greens, the oranges, the reds, those are good sources of, of beta carotene. Um, deficiencies of vitamin A, a lot of times um, it's night blindness. So people have difficulty seeing at night. The second grouping are the bone and teeth vitamins and minerals. So here we have calcium, phosphorus, vitamin D, and fluoride. Um, when you look at the bone and, and teeth, um, we have a, a matrix. The bone matrix is made up of calcium and phosphorus. So it kind of, you know, it's a, a nice, um, strong matrix, calcium and phosphorus. Where vitamin D comes in is vitamin D kind of washes over and makes that matrix hard. So calcium and phosphorus are the foundation and vitamin D hardens that foundation to make a strong bone. And then fluoride is involved in, the, the, in strengthening and protecting the, the teeth enamel. Um, milk and milk products are the best sources of vitamin D, calcium, and phosphorus. And then of course fluoridated water is, is the best source of um, fluoride.
when you think about deficiencies, you go back to their functions. So calcium, phosphorus, and vitamin D can all cause bone issues. Osteoporosis is the number one bone issue. It's a calcium deficiency. And, and osteoporosis means porous bones. So that, that matrix is kind of missing. So that sets you up for breaks. Um, and then, um, of course, vitamin D causes a rickett. You have the matrix, but it's weak. And you see rickets in children in developing countries. And if you look at pictures of them, they, they're bow-legged. And the, prep, the weight of the upper body on the bones, on the weak bones, it actually causes them to bow out. And, um, and then in adults, vitamin D deficiency is called osteomalacia. It's, just, it's soft bone. And of course, you all are familiar with a big epidemiology, um, dental decay and, and fluoride, and which led to all of the fluoridation of water. The next grouping are the antioxidants. Antioxidants, if just to give you a, a simple example, antioxidants are kind of like vacuum cleaners at the cell level. When, within the cell, there are a lot of chemical reactions going on and there are byproducts. Some of the byproducts, if they sit around, they can cause changes in the genetic material. Not good. Could be potentially cancer causing. So what the antioxidants do is they come in and they clean up those, those byproducts, those, those waste products of cellular reactions. Um, so it's when really it's kind of like fiber, you know, fiber in the large intestine, they bind the waste products of digestion and package it and excrete it. Well, and within the cell, that's when antibiotics, antibiotics antioxidants do. Um, the, the antioxidants are vitamin C, vitamin E, and selenium. Vitamin C is our friend here in Florida. It's the, you know, anything with citrus contains vitamin C. In addition to being involved with, um, as an antioxidant, vitamin C is also important for immunity. It's very important for wound healing. Um, it co collagen formation that helps with um, wound healing. Um, so that's an additional function. Vitamin E and selenium, they're pretty much just antioxidants. Um, sources, citrus fruits, as I said, um, the Sunshine State, vitamin C. Um, oils, have, um, nuts are good sources of vitamin E, very widespread. And vegetables and, and whole grains are good sources of selenium, very widespread. Most, you don't have to really work at it. Um, the main, you don't really see vitamin E and selenium deficiencies in humans, but a vitamin C deficiency, again, another nutritional epidemiology work, um, it's uh, scurvy. The um, sailors that traveled at sea, they didn't have their, their citrus fruits, and so by the time they got back from their long voyages, their, their teeth were falling out, their gums were bleeding, um, and that's how they, they gave one group limes, and that's why supposedly they're called limes now. Okay, vitamin K, very simply, it's the blood clotting vitamin. Um, it's, there are some 19 reactions involved in blood clotting, and vitamin K is involved in over half of those. Um, good sources are green leafy vegetables, liver, um, and vitamin K is very interesting in that the bacteria that the, the, bacteria, the healthy bacteria that reside in our large intestines, they make vitamin K, which we can then reabsorb as a, as a source. Of the vitamin. Um, any of your grandparents that have been put on Coumadin, they are put on a vitamin K restriction, so you've probably heard about I can't eat green leafy vegetables or things like that. Okay, next grouping are what I call the energy release vitamins. These are the old B vitamins thiamine, riboflavin, niacin, panathenic acid, and biotin. They all work together in the Krebs cycle, which Guess me now, the energy release TCA cycle. Um, if you didn't have to memorize that at some point in your college education, good for you. <laughs> um, 
the sources are really the whole grains, and what happens is the whole grains contain on the outer shell, the hull of the, of the kernel, they contain these B vitamins. But when they process the wheat, they take off that outer hull, and you lose the B vitamins. So if you look at your food labels, which everybody looks at their food labels, right? You're looking for enriched. Enrich, they're required by law to add those B vitamins back after they, they mill it um, because we want to get those very critical vitamins back in to, to the food supply. Um, so I just provided enriched grains really for all of them. In addition, for um, riboflavin, milk is a good source. Pork is a good source of um, niacin. Um, milk again for riboflavin. And then panathenic and ac panathenic acid and biotin are, are widespread. Um, and various forms of deficiencies that really kind of um, leave you feeling, um, it's not anemia, but really lack of energy because you're not converting the energy that you're consuming, as well as we see a lot of the B vitamin deficiencies in the mouth, the gums, the, the, the lips, a lot of um, cracks and bleeding. So the mouth is a real telltale area for, B, uh, for vitamin deficiencies overall. The next grouping are the blood cell nutrients, speaking of anemia. Um, B12, folic acid, and iron are all involved in the formation of red blood cells. Um, B12 is basically only found in um, animal foods. So a vegan has to make sure they're getting vitamin B12 fortified foods. Um, to get adequate amount of B12. Um, folic acid is more in your plant, your green leafy vegetables. Um, and B12, uh, folic acid, because of its link with neural tube defects, it's being added to a lot of food. So you'll see folic acid in cereals and orange juice, um, about as well absorbed as in plants, but though not, not, as, not quite as well absorbed, but still a good source. Um, and then iron, iron is, it comes in two forms, again, an animal form and a plant form. The animal form is very well absorbed, um, but, you know, Popeye the sailor man, you have to eat a lot of spinach to get all the vitamin, or all the iron that you, that you need. Um, there are little tricks. If you pair vitamin C with your plant source, so say you have a spinach salad and you put some tomatoes and carrots on top of it, it's going to increase the absorption of that iron, that type of iron, to as high as what you would get in the um, in in red meat. So little tricks that we can do um, depending on your eating patterns. Um, vitamin B6 is the protein vitamin because it's very important in the the formation of whole proteins, and the main source of B6 is is animal food, so meat and dairy. Um, iodine is the what I call metabolism mineral, um, very important in metabolic rate, and um, a deficiency causes goiter, that enlarged um, uh, thyroid gland, um, and in children when they have uh, iodine deficiency, it impairs the cognitive development, an old ugly term called creatinism. Um, but it's a iodine deficiency that results in mental retardation. Um, again, globally, I see, I've seen a lot of goiter, but because we have iodized salt, uh, we don't have an issue in the United States. Seafood is also another good source. Okay, the last grouping are what I call the water movement minerals. So these are sodium, potassium, chloride. They are very important in moving water in and out of the cells. Um, in addition to water movement, they're involved in acid-base balance. Um, and vitamin K has an additional uh, function, and that is still, um, it's with nerve impulses, in particular heartbeat. The food sources, um, sodium, potassium, chloride, what is that, sodium chloride, table salt, so anything with, with, that's canned or, or preserved with sodium, um, and potassium is in a lot of, of fruits, potatoes. And the last of all the nutrients, and you're all saying thank God, um, is water. 
water of all the nutrients that we talked about is the most, if I had to say it is the most essential or most vital. It makes up over half of the, of the human's body weight. It's found within cells and extra um, outside of cells and they're constantly moving through the cell membrane. And it's the electrolytes that help that movement. The functions are it carries nutrients throughout the body and then brings the waste for excretion. It's a lubricant between joints. It's involved in cushioning, surrounds the, the fetus. Um, it provides the cell form, and um, most importantly, well, very critically, is the temperature regulation. Okay, so it's the nutrient requirement. So that was Nutrition 101, the nutrients, but as I said, the big, one of the big challenges is that we don't always know a, a particular species exact nutrient requirement that many times we have to take a similar species and kind of ex ex extrapolate to um, another species. Um, but that's the general nutrients that, that we're trying to, to feed. A second um, factor to look at when you are planning um, a zoo animal site is the feeding type and, the di and their digestive tract. Um, of course, feeding types, that they range from carnivores, herbivores, to omnivores. But even within that, you have some species that are very selective, um, very specific. So pandas with bamboo, but, but you have carnivores that only eat fish or only eat insects versus those that have a varied diet. Um, from a nutrient standpoint, which do you think would be easier? The varied. The varied, because you're kind of assuring that with that variety, you're getting more and more of those of those vitamins and minerals and other nutrients. Um, their physical features are developed over time to help them find um, food and consume food. And I think, you know, one thing that's really important is trying to help them keep those, those features as developed and as healthy as possible. So you think about the, the teeth and, and the lions and so, could we give some bones to help keep their teeth healthy? Um, herbivores with their fat and flat molars to help grind the vegetation. So what can we do to um, mimic their natural diet and keep some of those other you know, um, features fine-tuned? And then you get into the digestive system. As a dietitian working with humans, this is very simple for me. Carnivores in general, we have a very simple digestive system. We don't have microbial fermentation going on and all the issues that go with that. But when you get into like the herbivores, they have much more complicated um, digestive systems. Um, they have that capacity to ferment carbohydrates. So when we have the ruminants, like the giraffes, the cows, um, the wildebeest, they have a foregut where the microbes reside and that they can actually ferment and we can, kind of like with vitamin K in our large intestines in humans, they can use um, that as a nutrient source. The non-ruminants, like horses and zebras, they are, their um, bacteria is in more of the hindgut. They have less of the fer fermentation going on. Um, just a couple of examples um, sent over from Eduardo at Animal Kingdom. This is the Colobus monkey, who is the primate equivalent to a ruminant because um, they have that large, sacculated stomach, um, and so they have a lot, they rely a lot on um, fermenting the fiber and other leaf based foods um, for the, the bacterial fermentation for nutrients. And then the hind, hind gut fermenters, um, so they have a variable adaptation with fiber um, and a more developed an example of that are the howler monkeys. And I think one thing that's important is that microbial population, we look at that even in humans. Sometimes when people go on a, a, a pretty in, intensive antibiotic, it wipes the microbial flora clean and, and then we get into a lot of issues with um, digestion because we don't have that healthy 
microbial flora. So keeping it as healthy as possible or replenishing it if we have issues like, um, you know, like a severe diarrhea or antibiotics. The third factor to keep in mind is the food access. Um, and this is where we get into um, issues about the quantity and quality of food offered. Um, very, the soil that the browse is grown from can, can vary in the nutrient content, um, how much production. So trying to analyze um, or having foods that they consume that have already been analyzed so you're assured of the nutrient content. Um, and when you think about, like right now I'm watching, I am paying attention, but I am watching the giraffe browsing and you know, so what's the content of the, the, the leaves that he's consuming and could that vary by seasonality? Um, another thing that can, that can affect food access is you keepers that are giving them the food. Um, the presentation, um, how you present the food to them, um, is it you know kind of like in a fun way or is it in a, an a aluminum bowl? But also, um, we had this, believe it or not, I, when, I, when I heard this, I, I, I just kind of laughed because it reminded me of the nurses when I worked in the hospital. And they come up and they deliver the tray to the patients and they take the lid off and they go, oh, it's meatloaf. <laughs> You know, well, do you want to eat that? I mean, already you're predisposed to not liking it. So sometimes, you know, keepers can, can you know, well, they don't really like that. And, you know, they don't maybe give them enough time to eat a vegetable, bless you, or, you know, they take it away quickly. Um, they, it's funny how we can put our own human preferences on, on others or on the animals. So even keepers can have a role. Um, in how accepted the, the food is. Um, and presentation is important. And of course the animal preferences too. The fourth factor to keep in mind when planning the diet is their health status. So infectious diseases, if they have some type of infection going on, that's going to increase their metabolic rate. If they have an open wound, it's going to increase their protein needs for healing. What we're really seeing and where we're overlapping so much more are the chronic diseases. So our, we're having more and more animals across species developing diabetes. I think we saw it first kind of in the primates, but now it's, it's crossing over to so many species that are experiencing um, heart disease, um, kidney disease. So um, and managing those animals are, are very much a challenge and how we make adaptations and especially the macronutrient content of the diet to promote control. Um, and monitoring is really critical, and I'd love to hear about how you all monitor, but looking at intake studies, of, you know, documenting how much they're taking in, um, and you can get real specific in your intake studies by weighing what you're offering them and comparing to um, what, is that, what is being excreted so you can get um, a, a real um, actual intake, um, analyzing the food that they've been provided, um, and then monitoring their growth and growth in still growing animals, but also weight biochemical data. It's really important to, to catch some of those developing issues early. Um, and even body condition. You working as closely as you do with the animals, you can see changes in their skin integrity, um, even how, um, you know, inflammation, if they're favoring certain joints or something, um, really that physical assessment that you perform is, is very important in monitoring for the health of the animal. The last consideration in planning the diet is how the animal is being managed. That extends to um, the enclosure, do they have lots of space to move around um, or is it limited? What are the environmental conditions? We talked about like heat, if it's really hot out, they're going to need more um, water, they might, they, they have a higher energy need during those times. Um, the feeding situation, things that you can do to promote movement. So if you can scatter their like some of their foods throughout to encourage them to move around. 
um, that that is really important. Um, I know you do some public feeding, and I was thrilled to hear that. Um, um, you know, one recommendation statement I saw was they discourage um, public feeding. But I, when I heard that you're giving romaine out, I loved it because that that is definitely a, a recommended food. Um, and then the presentation. Um, we had students that spent some time at Animal Kingdom, and for some of um, some of the uh, the gorillas, they would take pine cones and put the peanut butter in them, and you know, and really encourage you to play and seek out the food and move around. So presentation is really important too. Okay, so how do you translate all those factors into a diet? Well, it, there isn't one size fits all really. It really has to be a combination of something that's more of a combination of something of a nutritional complete feed and then adding food for enrichment. Here's um, an African elephant. That's the variety of foods. The, they use a lot of pellets over there, um, 8 to 10 kilograms of pellets. The haze, what types of haze are allowed. Um, the browse, which is elephant grass. They do enrichments with vegetables, um, supplements as needed based on the biochemicals. Um, and then water as needed. Here's another example of a tamarind. Um, and those various foods, the, a lot of vegetables and, and fruits, um, peanuts, flour, um, and then a seed mix in grams. Left, no, no variety, the, the, the tiger example of, of a wet diet um, with some, they rotate by day some type of, of bone or horsetail rabbit. And then I don't have the actual um, ingredient list, but here's a couple pictures of um, the pellets with enrichment that's provided to the keepers for a taper, tape here. Um, and here is the pellets that are used for the, for a low starch pellet that's used for the primates. Um, always food safety. Food safety is a, a big push for humans and it's a, a very important for animals too. Um, think about that, uh, you know, being sick from um, our foods. Um, supplement with thiamine when feeding thaw frozen fish because freezing causes you, um, destroys the thiamine content, um, and not feeding raw hamburger because of, of the food safety issues. And then I'm just finishing up with some of the crossover diseases that we've, we've seen. Um, obesity in primates here is one of, um, this is Gus, a gorilla that they put on a low starch chow. And after, they put him on a low starch chow, he was able to significantly lower his body weight. Just like humans, it's better to monitor and pick up the little weight gain and prevent further weight gain than putting them on a diet afterwards. Um, there was a gorilla that they had at, I, I don't think he's still alive, Gino at Animal Kingdom, and um, he was, very obese and they put him on um, a diet, increased activity as much as possible. Gino was one mad guy, <laughs> talk about hangry. Um, and so, you know, I mean, it's not all about, <laughs> it wasn't all about um, his diet restrictions, but you know, it is better to monitor and try to prevent or catch it early and intervene versus taking off a lot. It was when Gino came from another zoo that it overfed him and then they were trying to get him um, back um, back into a healthy weight, but talking about an anim animal management problem, you know, it was it was very tough. Um, some of the work that's been done on the iron uh, overload and the black rhinos, and we had some early discussions about, um, you know, in in nature, their rhinos diets um, are lower in iron. Um, <clears throat> And so they look at putting them on a, a low iron diet, 
chelating, giving a chelating agent to help bind the iron. Um, but I appreciate it. even some of the reading I started to see um, that there might be other factors involved. And I love that whole concept of, an, of inflammation, that putting them on an um, a anti-inflammatory diet might help um, prevent and treat some of, some of these issues. Um, and some metabolic bone disease that you see in a variety of animals um, with the Puerto Rican blue frogs, I can't remember, blue toads that Eduardo loves to work with. Uh, it, we looked at it was a calcium phosphorus um, imbalance, and so then giving them um, a phosphorus binder to help um, bring down um, the ratio or bring it back to healthy terms to treat metabolic, metabolic bone disease. Unfortunately, when this happens, it's pretty much irreversible. Um, and again, acknowledge Dr. Hobbies for his help in preparing for this. Um, and working with them over the years. So um, at this point, I'll turn it over because there's some interesting thoughts of what you all are doing here at Lowry.